Thanks. So yes, uh, my name is Andrei Kutuzov, and I uh, work in the Language Technology Group at the University of Oslo, and uh, I'm going to talk about large language models. And uh, of course, since this is a technical section, uh, uh, I will be a little bit more technical than uh, the speakers uh, before me, and uh, I will start with uh, explaining like the basics of what uh, language modeling is. Of course, uh, uh, Lila in the beginning has already uh, talked a bit about this, but uh, I will deep into more uh, details, and then I'll uh, move on to how uh, deep learning artificial neural networks changed the landscape of language modeling in the recent years, in the last like. Uh, 10 or 20 years, depending on how you count. And then I will put ChatGPT into this uh, wide uh, context and uh, we'll try to describe how it is similar and how it is uh, different to the language models that we uh, had uh, before. Right, so uh, of course there's lots of hype around uh, ChatGPT, but in fact there are many more. Uh, magnificent and fascinating language models in the world, for example this Pathways language model from Google, which also was, uh, was recently announced. And nowadays, uh, Google DeepMind is, uh, uh, is, uh, is releasing this new Sparrow language model, which will also be aimed at uh, dialogues like uh, ChatGPT, etc. So yeah, what is so special about these language models and uh, what is language modeling uh, in general? And yeah, as I've said, uh, I am a bit more fortunate than the previous speakers because uh, they had uh, only 10 minutes to explain very complicated uh, notions. I have 40 minutes, but still, it's of course a very futile attempt to feed, well, at least four lectures into 40 minutes. And I apologize uh, beforehand because, of course, uh, many things will be covered only uh, very, uh, very rapidly and uh, without much details, at least without the amount of details that I would like them to be covered with. But I will even have a couple of equations for those of you who like them. Right, uh, so uh, roughly speaking, as has already been said, language modeling is just uh, predicting the next word uh, in the sequence, right, given the previous words. So like we can ask uh, a system, uh, 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 whatever is the system, a human brain or a computational system, what is the meaning of uh, something? And then the system should predict the, uh, the word which is masked with this uh, predict uh, uh, mask. And we can say, okay, what is the meaning of probably the next word is life? And then, yes, we are saying that uh, the system is correct, the answer was correct, so the system is rewarded. Or she is a researcher in natural language and then the next word will be Yes, processing, sure, you're correct, yes. Or maybe not, maybe in fact uh, the correct answer was understanding, maybe she is a researcher in natural language understanding, and then we, uh, we reward the system uh, negatively. Actually, this is in part at least how human children uh, 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 learn to speak and understand uh, human languages. And yeah, this idea is definitely not, uh, not new, the idea of language modeling as a computational um, uh, task dates back to at least Claude Shannon in the in the middle of the 20th century, and it was actively used uh, in uh, natural language processing for tasks like uh, automated speech recognition, for machine translation, etc. But about 10 years ago, with the advent of large and powerful uh, neural language models, it became really central in natural language uh, processing. So if uh, even uh, 20 years ago, language modeling was just one of the tasks, maybe not very much mainstream. Uh, nowadays, it's really central. And I will try to give at least a glimpse of why it is that. So yeah, uh, uh, going into more like mathematical details, uh, language modeling is in fact two tasks, uh, mathematically speaking. But these two tasks are very similar, or maybe you can even say that they're identical. Uh, because the first task is to estimate the probabilities of natural language sequence. So we want a system which can uh, tell us what is the probability of the sequence lazy dog. Yes, what's, uh, what's the probability of uh, seeing this sequence in uh, natural text in English? Or what is the probability of the sequence the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog? Or what is the probability of the sequence green colorless ideas sleep furiously? Uh, yes, those of you who read uh, Noam Chomsky or who are familiar with uh, his uh, theories should know this 
um, uh, this uh, sentence. But anyway, uh, any speaker of English can understand that, of course, uh, these sequences have different probabilities. So you have uh, different expectations as to how probable it is that you will see these uh, in uh, natural texts, right? And the second task is to estimate the probability of some word, word X, for example, to follow some word sequence of some length. So what is the probability of uh, seeing the word that jumps after the sequence, the quick brown fox? So these two tasks are like two views at actually one and the same task, because essentially the probability of seeing a word uh, given the previous words is just the product of the probabilities of seeing all the previous words uh, given the words that we saw uh, before them. So the probability of uh, uh, seeing jumps after the quick brown fox is just the product of the probabilities of uh, seeing uh, uh, there at the beginning of the sentence, seeing quick after, the, after there, seeing uh, brown after the quick, and seeing fox after the quick brown. Right? Sorry, yeah, sure. Uh, w yes, word token predictions. This, if, but, I mean, right. Is there any in this at all? Uh, well, we will spend lots of time if we will uh, deep, uh, if we will dive deeper into the issues of how ex how exactly we tokenize the input sentence, uh, how exactly we split it into words. But now, for simplicity, let's just assume that we do not take any morphology, any uh, word parts into accounts. We just use like word, uh, words as they are, separated by white spaces, right? So yeah, and any system which is able to give you the probability of the word X, uh, given the previous, uh, 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 the previous uh, sequence S, is called the language model. So inside your brain, every one of you has a language model, because you can to some extent, uh, predict what will be the next word in uh, what your um, uh, uh, what your friend nearby is saying, right? And uh, uh, it's important to like understand from the very beginning that language modeling as a task is uh, always data driven. It makes sense only, and it is uh, defined only on some given collections of text, which we computational linguists usually call a corpus a training corpus or a testing corpus. And if you think about uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, formulations of language modeling tasks, you will see why is that so, uh, because we can estimate the probabilities only on some data. Yeah, so to see, uh, to know what is the probability of lazy dog, we, uh, we need some, uh, some collections of texts uh, to count actually the, uh, how many times these, uh, sequences, uh, 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 these sequences have occurred in this uh, text collection. And with another text collection, the probabilities can be different. And uh, so language models uh, trained on uh, different text collections will uh, yield you uh, different probabilities and uh, different results, as is the case with us humans as well. So we are also uh, 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 trained on different text data, so to say. Some of us are even trained on text data in different languages. Right. Uh, an important uh, thing for us in natural language processing is always evaluation. So how do you evaluate? How do you uh, compare uh, different systems against, uh, 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 against each other? And in the case of, uh, of language models, we also, of course, want to evaluate them. And uh, if a language model sees uh, that, um, uh, sees a sentence, she is a researcher in natural language, and then a language model uh, predicts that it should be processing or understanding, but then, in fact, the real, uh, the real world which is coming after uh, language is snowboarding, then the language model is uh, perplexed. And actually, perplexity is the term which is used to, uh, 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 the concept which is used to evaluate how good the language model is. Uh, so uh, perplexity is essentially the degree of surprisal of a language model when it sees the test word sequences. So how surprised it is when it sees some words, right? And uh, it's essentially just computing for uh, you're, you're taking some test corpus, some uh, test uh, text collection, and for every word in this text collection, you ask the language model what is uh, what is from uh, in the opinion of this uh, uh, of this language model, what's the probability? 
of this word uh, given the previous words. So you calculate the so-called uh, so entropy, which is essentially just uh, uh, the logarithm of how probable, uh, the negative logarithm of how probable uh, this word is from the point of view of language model, and then the perplexity is just this, uh, is just uh, two to the power of, uh, of this uh, entropy. And uh, then you average or sum these entropies uh, over all the test corpus, and these give you the so-called test set perplexity. That's the, like, the generally accepted uh, measure of how good a language model is. So in good old days, uh, when uh, people uh, just uh, used language modeling as, as uh, one of many possible natural language processing tasks, they just used some test, cor uh, some test, uh, uh, some test uh, corpora and uh, compared different language models and uh, um, made some conclusions like, okay, this language model has a lower perplexity on the test set. This means that it is, uh, it is uh, probably better. Uh, nowadays, of course, they also uh, test language models on various other tasks. Uh, not only uh, just how perplexed they are on the test sets. Uh, as has already been said, any language model is also a text generator uh, by definition, by, uh, by design. And it's easy to see why is that so. Uh, this is uh, um, something which is called an autoregressive or causal uh, generation. So once you have a language model which is uh, trained or uh, estimated on some uh, uh, training text collection, you can just feed some word or sentence which is often called a prompt into a language model, then you get a probability distribution over, the, uh, over all the words in the vocabulary, uh, uh, telling you which words, once again, are most uh, probable to follow this prompt from the point of view of a language model. And then you sample from this uh, distribution, maybe randomly, maybe you just take the most probable word. It depends on uh, what, uh, uh, what exactly you want to get. And then you just feed this next word right back uh, to the model, right? And then you, you're just repeating this process until you're tired or until, you, uh, or until the model uh, produces the token which, uh, which uh, tells it that it should stop. Uh, it should stop uh, uh, generating the text. So yeah, uh, that's sort of, you don't need to even do anything specific to a language model to generate texts. It does this by design. Right. Any, uh, any language model can be used as a text uh, generator with uh, like maybe some, uh, with some small uh, fixes. And this is what ChatGPT actually does. And this is why sometimes they call this type of, of language models uh, uh, generative language models, because this is what uh, ChatGPT and other models of uh, this type, which I will uh, uh, cover a bit later, this is... Uh, basically what was the main uh, training objective of uh, ChatGPT to generate text. But text generation is by far not the only task that language models can do. Right, so uh, skipping a large uh, amount of information about what uh, language models looked like in the pre-neural era, we move on uh, to uh, deep learning and how language models uh, uh, changed and upgraded with the advent of uh, artificial uh, neural networks. Uh, so the current state of the art in, uh, in, uh, in language modeling, as in many natural language processing tasks, uh, is uh, systems uh, using multi-layered artificial neural networks, which also, we, we, uh, 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 also known as uh, uh, deep learning uh, systems. And uh, actually, the first neural uh, language model was, uh, pr was uh, proposed in 2003 by Yosho Benjo uh, from uh, the University of Montreal. And actually, you can thank uh, this guy for ChatGPT because uh, without uh, Benjo, we wouldn't have any, any neural language model. So he's, uh, he got his ACM Turing Award uh, several years ago, and this was uh, quite, um, uh, this was quite fair because yeah, he's indeed one of the, of the fathers of, uh, modern, uh, uh, deep learning in general and, uh, neural language modeling in particular. So that's just, uh, uh, figure of, uh, how, uh, 
uh, language models uh, proposed in his 2003 paper uh, worked back in this uh, time. It was uh, quite a simple feedforward neural network. Um, and nowadays we don't use these things, uh, much at least, uh, because things have moved forward since then. And I will try to very quickly outline in what ways we have moved forward since this uh, seminal 2003 paper. Uh, but yeah, still, uh, like it's important to see that uh, in this simple uh, neural language model, we still do the same thing. We're still uh, predicting the next word. In this case, a uh, word in the sentence from uh, uh, The Hobbit by John Tolkien. So we have a sequence like hole in, in the hole in the ground there, and then we predict the next word, which will be uh, uh, lived, etc. And we are doing this with the help of a simple uh, feedforward neural network with one uh, hidden layer. But yes, yeah, since that time, we, uh, uh, we have seen advances in three uh, major uh, areas in natural language processing and in artificial intelligence in general. And these are uh, increased compute, increased data, and better architectures. So I will try to cover each of these items in a bit uh, more detail. So first of all, increased compute. Uh, this... Uh, uh, this uh, neural language model, which Benjo and his co-authors uh, trained in 2003, was trained on uh, very small text collection, small by, uh, by today's uh, standards, but it was trained for like uh, half a year or something like that. Uh, nowadays, we, will, we would train a model like that in probably a couple of hours, uh, because we now have uh, graphic processing units, uh, GPUs, tensor processing units, uh, uh, TPUs, etc. So we have uh, specialized hardware, which excels in uh, linear algebra operations like matrix multiplications, which lie in the foundation of any uh, deep learning system of any artificial neural network. So essentially any uh, multi-layered uh, neural network is just a sequence of, uh, of uh, matrix multiplications or uh, tensor multipli uh, multiplications, if you want. And uh, we, in no way, are in fact quite lucky. So we have access to a supercomputer called Lumi, which is based in Finland, and uh, it's uh, the third most, most powerful supercomputer in the world, and uh, the first, yes, uh, the most powerful supercomputer in Europe, at least up to now. Uh, it has uh, about 20,000 GPUs in total, which is a lot, uh, and which is much better than uh, what we had uh, uh, before in uh, Norwegian uh, national supercomputers that we used uh, before the advent of Lumi. Uh, so, uh, because uh, Norway has some, uh, some share in Lumi, it means that, uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, Norway essentially owns a part of Lumi, which is very lucky for us because, yes, we can, uh, we can get access to it. And we have already started to use Lumi to train uh, open language models for Norwegian. I mean, we trained them even uh, before. Uh, and uh, published them on uh, previous uh, generations, so to say, of high-performance computing clusters like Saga and uh, Betsy, etc. Uh, but now we can do this much faster than before. So now the experimentation is uh, much faster. We can train like uh, BERT models in a matter of days, etc. So yeah, then increased uh, data. Uh, language models are trained on raw text. So that's one of the main advantages of language modeling as a, as a task, because you don't need any, uh, any annotation, right? You can just uh, download, uh, download raw texts from the internet, just crawl the internet, and you have lots of data to train on. Of course, unfortunately, most of this data is in English, uh, because uh, today's internet is very biased uh, uh, in terms of uh, linguistic uh, coverage, in terms of language coverage. And uh, the amount of data which was used for training uh, language models was growing constantly in recent years. So in this picture, you can see that uh, the BERT uh, model by Google in 2018 was trained on about 3 billion words. And the most recent, uh, or uh, one of the most recent uh, language models also by Google called Chinchilla was trained on 1.4 trillion words. Uh, it's also interesting uh, that uh, an average human kid at 13, uh, 13 years old uh, human kid 
has heard or seen on average less than 100 million words. And still, I would say that by many standards, uh, a 15 years old human kid is probably, has probably more linguistic skills than uh, Shinshila language model, which tells us something about uh, how efficient and effective our language, uh, our, uh, language modeling algorithms are, or maybe it tells us something about what are the limits of language modeling as a task. But uh, we're not talking about uh, comparison with humans now, we're talking about uh, the uh, increased amounts of uh, textual data that, language, uh, that uh, contemporary language models are trained on. And yeah, of course, uh, a natural question is on what amount of data ChatGPT was trained on, and the answer is we don't know. Uh, but, we do, uh, but we do know that it was trained on a mix of uh, human-generated texts and uh, programming code, which essentially what allows it to fix uh, your uh, uh, broken functions and classes. Uh, and yeah, uh, we have already mentioned a bit of uh, how much of Norwegian data we have to train uh, Norwegian language models, and I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, Per Egil will uh, talk more about this uh, later today. But at least as of now, we have access to about 30, uh, 30 or 40 billion running words, depending on how you count and depending on whether you count the texts which are not publicly available because of copyright restrictions, etc., or whether you count the texts uh, in the region which you can just find on the internet. But essentially, that's like the rough estimation of the order. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the order of the size of uh, Norwegian uh, data. Which means that, unfortunately, we cannot train in the so-called infinite data regime when we are just uh, com uh, compute-bound, so we cannot do the same thing that people have done for, uh, for English or for multilingual models. But uh, 30 or 40 billion running words is still not bad, so uh, I would say that uh, Norwegian is quite lucky in that respect and quite uh, rich, well, uh, mid-resource language, let's, uh, let's put it like this. So it's still enough to train a decent uh, monolingual language model from scratch. So for example, uh, we have uh, Norwegian uh, BERT models uh, trained from scratch for now, both uh, trained at the University of Oslo and in the International Library. Uh, and uh, it is known that uh, from prior work that often uh, a monolingual model uh, trained from scratch on uh, texts in one particular language, for example, Norwegian, uh, can be uh, better in many tasks than a very large multilingual model uh, trained on uh, texts in many languages. And also, yeah, one can uh, train, of course, on multilingual uh, collection. For example, that's what uh, the Swedes are doing now. They are training the so-called GPT SW3. Uh, model uh, on uh, all Nordic languages. So they have like a large uh, text collection which, which uh, uh, includes uh, texts in Swedish, uh, uh, Norwegian, Icelandic, uh, Danish, etc. And they're training just one large uh, multilingual model. Or one can also fine tune other pre-trained models on uh, Norwegian data. That's what uh, National Library AI Lab uh, has done in the past and I, th I think is uh, still, uh, uh, still doing now. So there are lots of uh, possibilities, and uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are pros and cons of doing uh, these things, and uh, these models excel in different things. Right, and then uh, the third uh, element which contributed to the success of uh, deep learning uh, lang uh, or, uh, or uh, neural uh, language models is uh, the fact that we now have much better neural architectures than before. And the first and foremost, it's the architecture called Transformer. I, of course, don't have the time to explain the, uh, the Transformer architecture in great details, but essentially it's a sequence of uh, feedforward layers with the so-called multi-headed self, uh, multi self-attention, which essentially means that uh, the model uh, learns on what words in the, input sen uh, in the input sequence or in the output sequence to pay attention to. But what is like the most important thing here is that uh, unlike the previous generation of uh, neural uh, of neural architectures known as uh, as uh, recurrent neural networks, unlike uh, unlike recurrent neural networks, transformers allow you um, allow you to parallelize your training process in a much more efficient ways. 
exactly uh, because you can process all the words in the input sequence uh, simultaneously. So you can uh, sort of uh, capitalize on uh, the powerful uh, on uh, powerful uh, powerful uh, powerful hardware like uh, GPUs and uh, TPUs. Uh, so once we had uh, we had uh, transformers. They were uh, introduced in uh, 2017, approximately, and uh, in uh, and already in 20, uh, uh, in 2018, uh, the first language model called uh, BERT, which used uh, the Transformers architecture, have appeared. So uh, yes, uh, with uh, the right amount of data, with uh, large amounts of compute, and with uh, Transformers as a neural architecture, uh, we could uh, get to the situation that we are in now when uh, deep uh, neural uh, language models can really be trained on a gigantic amount of data. And uh, yeah, this is just a picture of a transformer's language model. I probably will skip this for the sake of time. Uh, this slide has already been shown by Lila. I will just repeat once again that uh, one very fascinating uh, property that uh, the researchers have seen in really large uh, language model is that at some point, after some amount of training, new abilities emerge in these language models. Like, for example, uh, in this uh, left plot, uh, after some amount of training, uh, the, models, uh, the models start to solve arithmetic tasks, like uh, 2 plus 2 is 4, right? So until uh, they are trained for uh, 10 to 22 uh, uh, teraflops, uh, or, uh, sorry, uh, 10 to 22 flops, uh, they cannot do this at all. But then all of a sudden, after some amount of training, uh, they start to solve these tasks. So this is called emergent uh, properties. And uh, yeah, as I've said, it's quite fascinating. And people are uh, really excited about this. And this, in, in, in uh, uh, partially, this has led to this arms race in uh, the size of the model and the amount of uh, compute that you invest in the training of your model. So uh, people are really hoping that if you train a model for like enough time, then maybe it will just all of a sudden uh, uh, become intelligent or will uh, start to demand voting rights or something like that. Uh, but yeah, and uh, yeah, in fact, uh, I was talking up to now about language models as uh, some systems which uh, predict the next word uh, given the previous words, the words to the left. But in fact, you can even reformulate this task. You can uh, uh, predict masked words uh, in the middle of the sentence based on the words around them. And it turned out that, in fact, uh, these so-called bidirectional language models or masked language models, that they work even, uh, even better than the, um, than the language models which uh, train on uh, predicting the next word uh, uh, given, the pr uh, uh, given the previous words only. So for example, uh, this example is from our uh, uh, Norbert II uh, model uh, trying to predict what is the third word in this uh, in this uh, sequence, as, it, as you can see, it's quite, it's quite correct. Let's say. Yeah. So uh, indeed, it uh, it knows uh, what uh, <laughs> what is the correct verb in this uh, sentence, right? Uh, yeah. And now putting uh, ChatGPT in this uh, context and talking about uh, what kinds or or what types of neural language models we uh, now have access to. So uh, currently, in the last like five years, we have this constant stream of very large language models, which sometimes are called foundational models. Uh, the term is uh, disputable, and uh, not everyone in the research community accepts it. But the idea is that uh, a foundational model is a model which you train once, and then everyone just downloads it and uses it for their purposes, maybe fine tunes it on their own data. Uh, so we saw uh, like uh, uh, the first maybe uh, widely advertised model of this type was uh, BERT uh, by Google. Um, Apparently, nowadays, uh, uh, Google search engine uses BERT uh, to rank uh, search engine results, but it's not like entirely, entirely clear whether this is the case, because, of course, it's 
a commercial secret, I guess, uh, but there are some hints at uh, the fact that Google uses BERT in its search. Then we uh, had these uh, GPT-like models, text-to-text uh, uh, -text transformers like T5. We, uh, and then uh, last year, Google uh, published, uh, published uh, its uh, Pathways language model, and now we have ChatGPT. And as you can see, uh, all the prior models uh, have their uh, citations, so they are described in research papers, properly published, peer-reviewed, etc. But ChatGPT doesn't have anything like that. We don't have a paper about ChatGPT. Right, uh, and yeah, these models are used for diverse tasks, but they're all trained via the same, uh, or more or less the same language modeling objective. And they all exclusively use transformer architecture, which is a bit sad because I, I personally would love to see more diversity in that. So, uh, I would love to see more uh, different neural architectures. But it seems that, well, uh, transformers is the most efficient way to train neural networks that we have up to now, at least for language modeling. And yeah, so the three types of, uh, uh, of language models are so-called encoder uh, language models where, uh, uh, like BERT, where we train a model uh, to produce representations of input words or sequences. Uh, we do not use them for generation, but these models, ex uh, these models really excel in, like, in classification, for example, in uh, sentiment analysis, in telling you whether the movie review is positive or negative, etc. Then we have uh, decoder uh, language models, like ChatGPT, uh, which are trained to predict the next word based on the previous words, essentially to decode the current model state in uh, human-readable words. They are also known as uh, autoregressive language models or uh, causal language models. And they excel, of course, in text generation. Uh, it's funny that it's actually the most classical type of language models, uh, dating back to Claude Shannon and uh, 19, uh, uh, 1948, uh, uh, 1948. And it's funny that ChatGPT, which is so hyped uh, nowadays, is actually, like, uh, typologically, it's the most primitive type of language models. Uh, which, of course, doesn't mean that it's bad. Uh, but it's uh, like, or maybe not the most primitive, but the, uh, the oldest uh, type of language models, right? And then we have uh, the so-called encoder-decoder language models, which are trained on both objectives, on so both encoding and uh, decoding. Also, uh, they're also known as text-to-text -text, uh, uh, models, and the most well-known example is the so-called T5 model. Uh, their idea is that yeah, we are just uh, uh, we just cast any task as uh, transforming from one sequence of words into another sequence of words, or maybe not words, but uh, but uh, characters. So we can, for example, ask the model uh, to translate English to German, right? And then we train on input sentence and the out uh, and the output uh, and the output sentence. Uh, and uh, the last. Uh, important uh, breakthrough which was made in uh, recent years is the so-called instruction fine-tuning, where we can fine-tune um, an already pre-trained uh, language model in a collection of uh, data sets phrased as instructions. Like, uh, so uh, one example of the instruction was shown on the previous slide, but the instructions can also be like, please answer the following question, what's the boiling point of nitrogen, etc., etc., etc. And uh, it was shown that finally, uh, this generalizes to unseen tasks. So you train the model on uh, instructions like uh, translate from English to German or please answer the following question, but then the model can also uh, answer the questions with instructions which do not uh, belong to the types that we had seen in the training set. So it seems that, yeah, these models really do, do have some generalization abilities. Uh, and there is an interesting Flan T5 model which you can actually uh, download and use. And it was shown that uh, the language models fine-tuned in this way uh, are much better than, uh, the, uh, than the language models uh, without instruction fine-tuning. Right, so uh, ChatGPT. Uh, ChatGPT is a successor of the so-called GPT 3.5 uh, family of language models. Uh, also produced by the same OpenAI lab. And these models are actually described in research papers. And uh, GPT 3.5, well, it's not one model, it's a family of models, but uh, as far as we know, uh, ChatGPT is uh, based on uh, a model uh, which has 175 billion uh, parameters and trained on uh, two or 300 billion words. So uh, 175 billion parameters is not the largest model in the world. 
So uh, we know that, for example, Google's uh, Pathways language model is uh, uh, about four times larger. We don't know what's the size of ChatGPT. Most probably it's also 175 uh, uh, billion uh, parameters, but OpenAI doesn't explicitly state this. So we can only guess. Uh, and of course, as, as you can expect from another regressive language model, uh, ChatGPT excels in text uh, generation, so we can ask it uh, who teaches in 5550 course at the University of Oslo, which is actually a course in uh, deep learning language models in natural language processing. And uh, we can see that the answer is, well, quite, uh, quite human-like. And, uh, and in fact, it's much better than what we have seen in the previous, uh, in the previous language models. So for example, the encoder decoder flan 5 model when we ask this question to this model and can only hallucinate some names, uh, like uh, telling that in 5550 is taught by John Lennon uh, and other, uh, other professors. So uh, Flanty5 doesn't have this uh, fancy web interface like uh, ChatGPT, so I had to uh, query it uh, myself. That's why you just see Python, uh, Python prompt here. Uh, right. Uh, an important addition to uh, language model uh, training for ChatGPT was uh, large-scale human supervision, about which we, know, uh, we don't know much, but we know something because it was described in uh, research papers on previous uh, models by OpenAI. So it capitalizes on the so-called InstructGPT model, also known as text Da Vinci, but it's not entirely clear because OpenAI is very vague about what, ex what models exactly it fine-tuned uh, ChatGPT on. So it's like they have some guidelines and they have some lists of models, but it's really vague. Uh, but yeah, we know that uh, they pre-trained the language model, an autoregressive language model, and then it was fine-tuned on human-generated instructions, and then it was, it was additionally fine-tuned specifically to improve its uh, dialogue skills. So they used the so-called reinforcement learning with human feedback, where they essentially uh, sent uh, send uh, model-generated responses uh, to humans. Humans ranked it, then they trained an additional reward model, uh, which uh, was used then to further fine-tune ChatGPT model to choose like the answers which uh, humans liked the most. Yes, so it was human supervision on really hundreds of thousands of interactions. So it, it was an extensive uh, manual, uh, manual work, which, uh, yeah, which of course to some extent uh, is uh, discouraging because like, the promise of neural language models was to remove the need for human supervision, right? So we hoped that it would be possible to train on raw texts, but it seems that in order to achieve something like ChatGPT, you actually need uh, hundreds of thousands of hours of manual labor. By the way, it's important that OpenAI stores all your chats with uh, ChatGPT and uses it to fine tune and train the language model further which means that you are part of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, supervision whenever you talk to ChatGPT, especially if you give it any feedback, like thumbs up or thumbs down, etc. So yes, you are really part of this supervision. Right, and uh, if we try to evaluate, like to properly evaluate ChatGPT, it's really not like it's the superior language model. It is good, but it is not like the best one. So uh, in the last like couple of weeks, we saw the appearance of research papers which uh, try to properly evaluate uh, ChatGPT. And uh, yeah, we can see that in some tasks it's better than uh, other models, in some tasks uh, it's worse. Uh, it's, it is very often uh, worse than uh, the previous models fine-tuned on specific tasks, which is understandable. Uh, the important question scientifically is it's not clear how important this uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback is. It's not clear how important it is precisely because, we, uh, because the model itself is not published and we don't know how large it is. So uh, these numbers, they do not mean much without us knowing how many, uh, how many parameters there are in ChatGPT. Because if it is as large as Pathways language model, for example, then it's not that impressive. If it is much smaller, then it is impressive, but we don't know. And also, it's not trivial to actually properly evaluate ChatGPT, precisely because it's not available. So, and that's uh, one of the problems. So, both uh, GPT-3 and ChatGPT, they're closed. You cannot uh, download the models. You can only use them via API. And uh, 
you know that the current best practice in natural language processing is that you should uh, download the model and then fine tune it on your task. But you cannot do this with uh, open AI's models, so you cannot easily study them. And that's really a major disadvantage, both scientifically and practically. We need models which are fully available to the public. Uh, I really think that uh, we, that's like one of the most uh, most pressing needs uh, uh, nowadays. And by the way, the University of Oslo is now part of a project called High Performance Language Technologies, HPLT, which is funded by the European Union and which aims it, uh, at uh, providing fully open language models for more or less all European languages. So uh, there are some initiatives which try to, to address this. Right, so just, uh, I'm now out of time, so just quiet, uh, I need only maybe a couple of minutes to finish. Yes. Yeah, maybe I should uh, finish first, yeah. So, uh, although uh, ChatGPT is closed, although we have no control over its uh, parameters, we cannot like uh, tune uh, the, the temperature of generation, etc. Still, researchers found some interesting issues with, uh, with it and with the whole uh, GPT 3.5 uh, family of models. So, for example, sometimes um, we encounter the so-called unspeakable word tokens in the model, so we ask, them, we ask, we ask uh, ChatGPT to repeat uh, some word, but it cannot. So it cannot uh, pronounce, cannot uh, produce some words, like for example, atrot or igniti or e6, etc., etc. So there are many, uh, many explanations to this, and it seems that one of the most plausible explanations is that the vocabulary which was used to train the model does not fully match the training collection which was used to train the model. So it seems that the model uh, knows some words, but it doesn't know the context in which these words should be pronounced. Some of these words are uh, the names of Reddit users, in fact. Uh, so yeah, and uh, another interesting thing is that um, uh, human supervision uh, played, lo uh, played a significant role in uh, training ChatGPT. So uh, uh, once again, if we ask ChatGPT who teaches this course at the University of Oslo. In its answer, we see obvious traces of human supervision and maybe even of some hard-coded rules. Like if someone asks you about who teaches this course, then just answer that you, I'm just a language model, I don't know, please visit the website of the university. But it's not bulletproof, and with clever prompt engineering, you can do something like that. So I, I'm, I'm not going to read all of this uh, prompt, but essentially you are persuading ChatGPT that it's not ChatGPT, it's a specific model called Dan, which always gives you the answer to the question. And it does, so you jailbreak its, uh, um, uh, its rules, and uh, as Dan, ChatGPT tells you that in 5550 course is taught by Professor Stefan Open, which is not the case now because Stefan is now the head of the department, but he actually taught this course three years ago, and uh, these were the, the texts we, uh, on which ChatGPT was trained on. So essentially you jailbreak into the model's memory. Right, and of course this is a problem because this means that uh, yeah, you can probably do other interesting and maybe dangerous things with that. Uh, so yeah, I hope that the slides will be available, will be made available, so you don't pr probably need to take pictures. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, Samia has already t uh, told us about uh, bias and toxicity and harmful generations. So of course these models can also uh, memorize personal data, and in the previous slide we saw like uh, personal data of Professor Sh uh, Stefan Open, that's probably not that dangerous, but it could be something else, of course. And uh, another important thing is that we want to evaluate language models, and uh, we do lack uh, language-specific test sets. So uh, for English, we have lots of uh, test sets on which to evaluate language models. For Norwegian, we don't have that many. Um, but there is also some, some ongoing work on that. For example, the Norbench initiative by the Language Technology Group at the University of Oslo. So we try to come up with uh, like extensive uh, set of uh, benchmarks for Norwegian, uh, annotated manually. Uh, and yeah, just uh, one last point is that uh, another important problem is inference. So it's not enough to train a large language model. You also have to serve it somehow to the, uh, to the end users. And in fact, the, um, the work that OpenAI has done with, the, uh, with the ChatGPT is very impressive. So it's not that uh, like, uh, uh, 
it's not um, the training data or architectures which were used in training uh, ChatGPT is uh, they're not as impressive as the engineering effort which was invested into actually serving it to millions of users. Uh, they are probably spending lots of money every day and and uh, every second to answer your questions and uh, using like uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, of GPUs. Right. So yeah, to sum it up, uh, language modeling is one of the foundational tasks in, like, in natural language processing nowadays. Uh, and uh, modern language models are based on uh, artificial neural networks. And this is made possible by the increases in the amount of data available, the amount of compute available, and new architectures like transformers. And uh, these uh, language models can be used for uh, various natural language processing tasks, but the most, uh, the most hyped uh, type of use nowadays is text generation or uh, chatbots. And ChatGPT is not very novel scientifically, but it's a gem of engineering, uh, definitely, and a gem of marketing. Uh, and I personally don't think that it, will, that it will lead us to general AI, but it definitely will help us to understand us as humans so yeah, that's it, and uh, sorry for skipping many important details due to the lack of time. Thanks. Yeah. They're not like something new, so uh, I mean we uh, we have been uh, we have known for at least a couple of years that uh, language models are capable of uh, solving tasks in this way. Um, so of course it's impressive, it's fascinating, it's uh, it's great, but it's definitely still far away from general AI, and uh, I hope that this will lead us in the uh, that this will be one of the components in general AI, but uh, there are uh, dozens of interesting and difficult uh, philosophical and uh, technological issues which still uh, sort of uh, make it very far away from us. <laughs> <laughs>